This is the Meat Eater Podcast coming at you shirtless, severely bug bitten, and in my case, underwearless. We hunt the Meat Eater Podcast. You can't predict anything. The Meat Eater Podcast is brought to you by First Light. Whether you're checking trail cams, hanging deer stands, or scouting for elk, First Light has performance apparel to support every hunter in every environment. Check it out at firstlight.com. F I R S T L I T E dot com. I'm going to have Corinne set up a complaint hotline where people could complain about uh, Dirt Myth. Oh, whoa. Dirt? <laughs> Let me tell you why. It's be a short list, man. We... <laughs> what, what, what are you doing? What do you got going on with your chest there? <laughs> Hot. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Just so uh, our plan a year ago, a year ago, to almost to the, to the T, we recorded an episode Traveling down the highway in Alaska in a van. Mm-hmm. Great episode. Mm-hmm. Great episode, yep. You know, uh, a lot of energy. It, yeah, a lot of energy. Great episode. It was a little road trip. Very I, successful. I know where this is it was going. A very successful episode. Some people say the most successful episode. Really? All, all Maybe time. the greatest well, no, podcast of like, all time. I'm trying to make it seem like, yeah, I'm really kind of like trying to build up so people get extra mad at dirt. <laughs> The plan was we were going to do that same thing, the second annual, same stretch of highway, same time of year show. Uh, well, we get just getting ready to do it. And now a little complication in the meantime is now we launch these episodes. These episodes are available on YouTube video. And old dirt can't do myth. Mm. It's never been mentioned. Says that it can't be done. It can be done, but not, I, not with what we got going on. Yeah. What are you buttoning into this for, Seth? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm setting the, the, the record straight. <laughs> I've been watching driving scenes since Strange Brew. <laughs> with a God. lot of gear behind that no, scene. There's a driving scene in Strange Brew. I've been watching driving scenes since I was a little kid. Scooby Doo, cartoon man. Well, no, okay. Never mind that example. <laughs> Dukes Dri- of Hazard. Dukes of Hazard. I've been watching driving scenes my whole life. Somehow, Dirt says they can't be made. <laughs> no, not in, not in our set. <laughs> not with the equipment that we have. <laughs> so we're stuck filming. Not that I have any problem with this. We're in a little bunkhouse. Pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Airplanes flying around. Yeah. Static. And we're gonna make our. We're gonna make do. Thank but you. I want listeners to know that the reason you're not getting served up another phenomenal Meat Eater Podcast Van Life episode part two is because of dirt. And it, Man. It, you'd get car sick if you watched that episode. Um, it would be a little bouncy. I don't think yeah. that's fair. It, I, don't, I mean, yeah. have we told people where, where we're at, like the general vicinity of planet Earth? We're in eastern Alaska. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. No, I just think that it's not fair to blame that on dirt. That this podcast isn't happening in a van because of him. Well, what do you think the problem is? Well, there's a lot more that would have to go into it to be able to film that. Yeah. There mm-hmm. would have to be special camera rigs set up and send your complaints to uh media not production. Me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh Okay. A lot of feedback. You were were you there? You know, you weren't there. We interviewed the esteemed historian Elliot West. No, I wasn't there. It was a great episode. Mm. On that episode, I, I debuted an old saying I came up with. I'm trying to like get an old saying going, like I made one up. A long you know time I mean? ago. Yep. Well, I made up a saying that's new, but it's like an old saying. And it was, what prompted it was, uh, like if you tell your kids to go out and pick the pole beans, and they'll, you'd be like, well, how many do I pick? I'm like, pick all of them. Pick them all. And they'll come in and be like, I picked them all. And you go out there and look, and they didn't get them all. No way. Or you'd say, you, someone's like, oh, I'll go pick strawberries. I'm like, pick them all. And they go dig around in the strawberry bed, and then you go look, they didn't get them all. Yep. So my old saying I came up with is, a fresh set of eyes will always find more beans. <laughs> mm. And I'm like trying to get it going. I'll use that. I'll, well, people don't like it. I'll proselytize that. What people, just the family? People wrote in. Oh. My wife doesn't like it. She thinks it's stupid. That's important. Phil says it's got no, like, it doesn't roll off the tongue. 
I mean, it could be helpful though because a lot of human life is spent looking for lost stuff. Uh-huh. I mean, a fair, I'd say twenty percent of life. People yeah. rolled in with some edits. Yeah, yeah. Saint <laughs> Saint Anthony, remember we talked about this. Yeah, say, oh, yeah. say that Saint Anthony deal. <laughs> Saint so Anthony, we were, we were Saint losing Anthony. stuff at camp. Yeah, it's Dirt knows this. Yeah. Saint Anthony, Saint Anthony, please come around. Something's been lost and cannot be found. Mm-hmm. And then and a bam. And, and so, if you say that while you're looking for something, you find it. Yeah, you know. and that's a that's a that's a Catholic saying. It's a, yeah, yeah, it's a Catholic thing. And, so, and Clay mentioned that he goes right to the big. I boss said I just, I just go straight to the boss. <laughs> go to the head man. <laughs> Yeah, he, he cuts, he, he circumvents, he goes around, cuts around the middleman. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, some edits came in. It's getting better. So what I'll say is, it has applicability in finance, and someone even pointed sure. out, oh, like bean in counter. finance for sure, like even yep. bean counters it has applicability in finance. Like, like you're looking for your deductions, you know, you look at tax time, you're looking for deductions. fresh set of eyes, and someone's always like, more well, beans. hey, but what about that new wallet you bought? You carry work stuff in that wallet. That's a business expense. Count that bean. So fresh set eyes will always find more beans. I thought it had a lot of, Brody thought it had applicability in glassing. Mm-hmm. Someone's like, no, I glass that whole hillside, nothing up there. And then someone new sits eyes down. always find more like, beans. There's a bowl. Right? So edits came in. A new view gathers more beans. No. 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 A second look invested brings more beans digested <laughs> i like the rhyme it's clever but yeah a fresh set of eyes will always find the prize no bean mm. mention new eyes find new beans <laughs> <laughs> too boring <laughs> a, fr- <laughs> a fresh set of eyes will see where the beans lie <laughs> Or my buddy Matt Dross wrote in. He said, also, this is a text message I got. I appreciated the relatability of your made-up old saying about relooking for beans. Whether it's beans, pickles, by which I think he means cucumbers, morels or whatever. One highly tuned-in individual can always find more even after someone just, quote, picked them all. Maybe the saying should be, a fresh set of eyes yields more of the prize. Mm. Oh, that's pretty good. I think there should be Jack and the Beanstalk somewhere in there. That's, that's not going to work, Dirk. That's a magic bean, man. <laughs> um, a couple announcements. And Clay, you're going to be here for some of this. We have a live tour coming up. Uh, this is going to be great fun. Clay's going to hit some of it, but he's going to be out wolf trapping for some of it. Mm-hmm. Me and Dirt. Oh, you and Dirt are gonna be wolf trapping. Me and Dirt, we're like yeah. Clay's working like on a mud and clay. Yep. Dirt and mud. <laughs> dirt and clay. Dirt, what do you, dirt, what do you make dirt and clay? You get kind of a dry clay. Kind of loamy. Yeah. <laughs> um better for some plants to grow in. Yep. Clay's working on a bear grease road show about uh he's he's profiling a wolf trapper. He's he's working on a bear grease road show about a wolf trapper. So he's going to miss some of the live tour dates. Um, our live tour is going to begin on December 6th. Really would appreciate people really coming out. So uh, the Laughing Eagle, Giannis Putelis, will be there for all the shows. We're, we're, we're still putting everything together. He'll be there for the shows. Um, Spencer Newhart's going to be there because all the shows are going to have a local trivia component to them. Lots going on. bunch of other people joining. Friends, special friends, special guests every night. Wednesday, December 6th, first show of the tour. We're going to be at the Mission Ballroom in Denver, Colorado. Let's go Denver. Yeah. December 7th, anniversary of Pearl Harbor, Kansas City. Let's go KC. Foley Theater, Kansas City. We're going to take a night off on December 8th. I got to find something fun to do that night. December 9th. Saturday, December 9, Davenport, Iowa. You're about an hour from Cedar Rapids and about two and a half hours from Chicago. Capitol Theater. December 10, Kalamazoo, Michigan. Home field advantage for Yanni. Um, I didn't grow up far from there. My wife's from there. Yanni's from there. Kalamazoo State Theater. We've done that place before, as has Bob Dylan. Who got more views? Us. Yeah, <laughs> we sold way more albums. 
December 11th, my daughter's birthday, Royal Oak, Michigan, so greater Detroit area, Royal Oak Music Theater. 12th, taking off, got to find something fun to do. December 13th, Cleveland, Ohio at the Agora. December 14th, Munhall, PA, so the greater Pittsburgh area. Carnegie Homestead, Carnegie of Homestead Music Hall. Friday, December 15th, Glenside, PA, Greater Philadelphia area, Keswick Theater, Meteor Live show. Nice. Going to be big, man. Laughs, trivia, prize winning, funny stuff. Another thing we're working on, this this we need, this is a listener. We need this, we need this is listener help. I've been thinking about doing We've been thinking about starting a thing that would be a part of the show, which would be a a dissection of trail cam mysteries. Hmm. Because we get a lot of these where people send in trail cam photos like, what in the hell is that? Is that a mountain lion? Sam Squatch one's too, Bray. Yep. Is that a Sasquatch? Is that a mountain lion? Why is that buck? What's wrong with his eye? I recently got (laughs) one where Buck's got one of that. that, There's a weird virus that deer get. It's like like a part of the herpes complex. That makes their eyes get all this growth over them. So someone sent that in, right? Or someone might send in, is that a bobcat? Or is like they're like, is that an old naked hippie? Whatever. And you can't tell what's going on. <laughs> Just Clay Newcomb. <laughs> <laughs> Picking the beans out there. <laughs> Fresh set of eyes. So <laughs> beans. what we need are we need your um we need your trail cam mysteries. And here's the thing. Here's the brand promise. When you send us a trail cam mystery, like if it winds up being like biological in nature or whatever, like this herpes complex deal that blinds deer or cactus bucks, whatever. Crazy stuff from your trail cam. Or what is that? Is that a mountain lion? Questions. We will get, we will go through our contacts of many biologists and experts and ecologists, disease specialists, whatever hippie experts, naked hippie experts, we will get you the answer. Then we will post, we will post your photo with the feedback and we will cover it and dus- discuss the photo on the podcast to get you a great answer of, of like, like whatever it is. From the experts. Now, From I mean, the you can't experts, do this or with, with everyone, yeah. just the, the unique ones. The ones, ones that need it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I w- what kicked this off is the other day I had a great trail cam photo from my otter cam where I couldn't tell if it was a beaver's butt or an otter's butt. Mm. And it sparked a, a little bit of a, a spirited debate. debate about whether that's a, the butt of an otter or the butt of a beaver. So that got me thinking that this would be a great service and I would have submitted my own photo to expert panel, which I mm-hmm. did because mm-hmm. I just through professionally, I know a lot of great people. Oh yeah. So I sent it to a guy that has handled thousands and thousands of beavers and hundreds <laughs> of otters and asked them, well, whose butt that was, <laughs> right? We will be able to provide this service for listeners who have crazy trail cam photos. All you need to do is go to send it, send your trail cam photo. Just put the title like crazy trail cam photo or whatever. And send it to the Meat Eater Podcast at themeateater.com. The Meat Eater Podcast at themeateater.com. Also, complaints about dirt can go there as well. Hey, so uh, do like complaint about dirt in the subject line, or if it's trail cam, just trail cam. Hey, let me, let me, I'm, I could probably be of help. I'm not an expert at a whole of, of many things, but I am the world's expert, the best in the world. I'll, I'll debate anybody on this fact at identifying American Black Panther trail camera photos. You good at it. You send me a, a feline that you suspect is an American Black Panther, I will 100%. And you'll take them. it to your, you'll take it to your father. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I have people, <laughs> but I get them all the time. As nice. we're as we're talking about this, I had a couple of trail cam photos come in on the cell camera. Yeah, as we're talking. Any as mysteries? We're talking. No, it's pretty straightforward. It's a white-tailed doe and a cow elk in the field together. Okay. Nice. So that's a service that we're going to provide. And when, when your thing gets selected, you know, we'll even send you some kind of present. I'm going to regret saying that. We're going to send you some kind of present. If your thing gets selected, we'll post the photo. We will get expert testimony, and we will have an actual debate and explanation of the photo. 
And if, if you watch on YouTube, we'll just have the photo up. If you listen, you can just go on social media to view the photo and weigh in on what in the hell you're looking at. It's called, I think we should call it the, what in the hell is this thing for my trail cam? <laughs> Simple. <laughs> yeah. Everyone so, wins in this, it sounds something like. Something like that. Y'all didn't get the punchline to my Black Panther deal. Oh, there was There one? are no Black Panthers in America. So the answer is always, well, no, buy, it's not. Why did I buy that believer hat? <laughs> That's not what Gary Newcomb says. <laughs> why do my we sell, dad, why do we my sell, dad believes him. Why do we sell a Black Panther believer hat? Just, I mean, half of this country believes in him. And my dad's like the president. <laughs> <laughs> I once read, we've talked about this, but I once read, or someone said, a Black Panther is a wet panther. Mm. What do you think about that? It's a wet mountain lion. I mean... I hear you. They could be it's definitely make them darker. You don't think that that's always the case? <laughs> no, no, no. I think people are seeing uh, they're seeing black house cats. They're seeing Labrador mixed breed dogs like flashing in front of their camera and like a streaky photo that makes his tail look a little longer than it is. Mm-hmm. They're seeing uh, usually it is off scale feline house cats that that just it looks big in the in a picture but it's actually not big or if you hear one that you think is a panther see people don't you know the vocalizations of the mountain lions sure they vocalize but so do bobcats that's what i was thinking and so i think a lot of people mistake the the bark of a gray fox for some type of big cat god i mean gray foxes make a kind of a harrowing <laughs> Mm-hmm. Could you do that a little louder? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like I heard a, that. It sounds like Clay. Sounds like a drink last yeah, night. It sounds like <laughs> someone throwing up. <laughs> it's, it's like a. <laughs> it's it's Clay like Clay drank a, too much Tundra <laughs> water without filtering <laughs> it out. It's kind of a. It's an odd sound you wouldn't expect coming from a little gray fox. Yeah, I think people think that's a panther scream. Yeah, they want to believe it. It's a panther. They want to believe. This is a this is an announcement rich. This is a we're you're in an announcement rich bunk house right now. A new dirty dozen calendar for 2024 has been on sale at the Meteor store. Go get one now or get five. Now, cal- so we do calendars. Years ago, we did uh fucked up old deer stands. Great calendar. Yep. And we did fucked up old taxidermy. Phenomenal calendar. But this year, it just so happened that, and this is going to tie into something we're going to talk about now. It just so happened that, just so happens that you got, how many months are in a year, Clay? Uh, Twelve. Twelve. Okay, hold that in the back of your head and try to stay with me. Twelve months in a year. (laughs) We are just now releasing season 12 of Meat Eater. Twelve years you've been doing it, Steve. And the way we do it is, a season winds up being a year's worth of episodes. It could be, you know, it could be in the old days we might have done sixteen. We might do six, whatever. But we do it's like a season is a year's worth of episodes. We we vacated our theme. I wanted to do fucked up old fish cleaning stations and boats. And just people. <laughs> <laughs> fucked up old individuals. <laughs> 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 but that whole franchise is on hold because of the fortuitous, like the serendipitous deal that that 12 seasons aligns with the 12 months of the year. So we've made a very memorable calendar, a wonderful gift, where each month is a year. So it's beh- each month, January, is all behind-the-scenes photos Good times and laughings is all January is all behind the scenes photos from season one of Meat Eater. Sweet. Fe- guess what February is, Dirt? Well, Valentine's Day. No, second season. Oh. It's all be- <laughs> it's all behind the scenes photos from the second season. Oh, that's cool. So you'll see so many of your favorite, like memorable characters from from over the years. Dirt's in the calendar, Clay's in the calendar, Seth's in the calendar. Um, Joe You're Rogan's in the calendar. Kevin Murphy's in the calendar. I, I saw the calendar. I, I there was a lot of scowling Steve photos. <laughs> we call that's that, what we I call it stank face. Yeah, stank, there was a lot. There was like face. a lot of like this. 
Oh, Steve Stankface. I'm looking at the camera like this. <laughs> harkens back. Yeah, like harkens back to, you know, we didn't put in there as any of my hospitalization photos that came out of the show. Getting hospitalized. That could be its own calendar. I should have thought of that to put some of that in there. Um, So it goes back to when Yanni, so the calendar goes back so far in time that you'll see when Yanni was working for us but didn't realize he was getting paid. <laughs> yeah, that's big. We hired Yanni to carry a backpack on a sheep hunt. He thought he was just going to hang out. And then someone gave him his tax paperwork at the end of it. And he's like, what's this? <laughs> so, so you can get paid. Oh, I saw we were dicking around. <laughs> and then what a guy. To, what a guy, that, to, Yanni. Yeah. Then went on to produce dozens of episodes. Probably more than anybody. Yeah. That's so yeah. cool, man. Um, so the calendar covers a great span of time. It's a really fun calendar. So check that one out. Dirty Dozen. Calendar. Sweet. A lot of Seth's photos in there. Probably. Yeah, a lot of Seth's photos. From season eight forward. Yeah, eight forward. Mm-hmm. My photos. He was taking pictures when you were wiping your mom's nose. <laughs> That's right, Clayton. Close. <laughs> Close. <laughs> so check that out. Uh, a lot of Dirt's photos in there. Oh, Dirt's got photos in there. So here, here's the other thing about this whole deal. So if you're listening to this right now, this, this all ties together. If you're listening right now, our latest season of Meat Eater, season 12, is out. It launched on October 12th on the Meat Eater website, so TheMeatEater.com, and on the Meat Eater YouTube channel. Wait a minute. Season 12 is where? On our own website. What date? October 12th. Oh, okay. Got it. Oh, it's going to be good. Yeah, man. It's going to be good. So yeah. if you're listening right now, it's out right now. October 12th, Meat Eater website on the Meat Eater YouTube channel. Wait. And it is, like I said, some days, like a long time ago, we would make 16. How many we got this year? We did six. Six. Wait, October 12th? Yep. October. If you're <laughs> listening and it's not past October 12th. Then you can go watch it right now. Right now. Sweet. We're rolling out a episode a week. Okay. So for six weeks, starting October 12th. Yeah. So we have, and we can read, you guys are all here, so mm -hmm. it were, it, some of you were here for some of these. Seth, you were here for everything. I think. Mm -hmm. So I drew this crazy uh, elk tag in Montana called the Buffer Zone. I missed that one. That sounded yeah. awesome. That was a cold. Oh, my God. That was that cold. cold. <laughs> yeah. Cold. You went in November? Mid November. November. Yep. Yeah. And you're hunting like right on the edge of the park. They give out five tags a year. And you mm -hmm. get this little shit and chunk of ground, not very big, you got to hunt on. And it's right on the edge of the park, and you're catching elk migrating out of the park. Mm. You know, everybody thinks of migrations as going south in the winter, but they're actually mi in this place, they're migrating like northward. Hmm. Um, just elevation change, right? Hmm. So we got that coming out. We got another phenomenal. We took uh, our buddy Kevin Murphy to Michigan. Cottontail rabbit bonanza with rabbit beagles. Squirrel bonanza with squirrel dogs. A raccoon that the dogs treat a squirrel. Try, try to picture this. <laughs> you got, you got oh, bit yeah. by a dog under this tree. I did that dog. <laughs> Yeah. Got bit, well, got attacked by a dog. Oh, yeah, you got, you got attacked by a squirrel dog. at that exact moment. Yeah, he was fired up, man. And I had poison ivy, and I, and I took a bunch of Benadryl, wasn't really thinking about it, and I thought I was aging like uh <laughs> You're blaming it on age. I you thought I was aging climb a like I was in a time capsule. <laughs> you had Benadryl poisoning. I couldn't... <laughs> A squirrel got hung up in a tree, and I tried to climb up the tree, and I couldn't get up the tree. And I thought I was like, I thought I was dying of old age. <laughs> and then it, it occurred to me that I'd eat Benadryl midday, and it even affected my vision. <laughs> I was so hopped up on Benadryl. You were, they should have taken away my firearm. <laughs> You're still plinking them squirrels, though. Yeah, because well, that slows your heart rate down. It makes you a good shot. But when it comes to squirrels <laughs> retrieving, so we had a squirrel. You'll see this happen in this episode. 
the the odds of this are so oh, they're, they're wow. like infinitesimally small. Where the dog trees a squirrel. A squirrel runs up a tree and stops, comes to rest. What was it 18, 20 inches? The the yeah. diameter from a raccoon. From raccoon. Oh yeah. The, that's just daytime. hanging out in the tree. The coon happened to be in the tree. This daytime, yeah. The squirrel passed the coon up and plasters himself against the tree. So there's a squirrel and a raccoon 20 inches apart. Mm. He got double tap on that one. Which drew our attention to both the raccoon and the squirrel. I think that raccoon was big. on the ground when we set the dogs loose and he really caught them by accident in an area. Cause we, no. Why would the squirrel be up that tree too? Well, no, no. I, I think the raccoon... When we got out and set the dogs loose and they started barking or whatever, the, if you if you recollect the tree that that raccoon was in, no raccoon would ever be in a Wasn't tree a like that. Tree. No, I think. But why would a raccoon and a squirrel go up? No, the same I think tree? the raccoon heard us from a distance and was like, "I'm going to get up a tree. This is the only option I have at the moment." There was a lot of trees in there. Yeah, but that was a, there was, was not a lot of big trees there. This, this, this was a to me, two. boys, and it just it just so happens that the. Squirrel ran up the same tree. It was. Let, a, let me tell you, I'm a, I'm still a squirrel a and a coon but... hunter. Long time doing it since your mama was still wiping your nose. <laughs> this is an unanswerable riddle. Your mom wiped dirt's nose. <laughs> we go way back. <laughs> unanswerable riddle. Yeah. Anyway. It Hon, was you're, a clump. You're, you're stepping in to declare that it's no one's going to know. <laughs> it was a clump No one's going to know trees. the sequence, what anybody was thinking. Just. You'd have to do just, exit interviews. Yeah, yeah. If, I like if what you, he's saying, If you though. looked at the tree that the raccoon was in, you'd be like, no way a raccoon is going to climb in that tree just to sleep for the day. No, it, it actually sounded like the start of a good joke. Raccoon and a squirrel in the same tree. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. Four guys walk up to the tree. <laughs> One guy says, look at the coon. The other guy says, look at the squirrel. The other guy says, that dog just bit me. <laughs> <laughs> Who gets to shoot the squirrel? Yeah, the Not dog the, got so excited it bit dirt. Yeah, it was. He didn't know what to do with himself. <laughs> yeah, he was wound up, man. So Kevin <clears throat> Murphy didn't even know, and he's the small game guru. Guru Clay. Yeah. yeah, but Kevin Murphy says he's had it happen before, which I'm like a slightly incredulous of. No, no disrespect. Uh, Seth, I want to revisit something you're saying. What? <laughs> I like what you're saying. Okay. It was a little. Um, wasn't a hemlock? Was it a hemlock? I don't remember exactly. It was a clump of trees. Yeah, why did... Yeah, I, I like, if it was that that coon... Because that was not where a coon would just lay up for the day. No. Because he'd lay up where he could just get on a big old limb way up high. Well, yeah. Hey, guys, could it be? Could it be that there was a concentrated food source there that the coon and the squirrel were hammering together? No. And then... Because that squirrel went a long ways to get there. Really? Mm-hmm. So just maybe totally coincidental. I think that it was one of the few conifers, and they knew that that conifer would offer some protection. It did. But it's hard to picture that these two unrelated creatures, of all the trees and all the woods, that these two creatures, unless they are hanging out, this would be a good children's story. Would have not only (laughs) gone up the same tree, but would have gone up the same tree the same to the same height. And sat there. It's one of the great mysteries. But you, you got him and climbed up there and retrieved him. Or the coon. I think one so. of them fell out and one of them didn't fall out. I think the squirrel fell out. Go watch the episode and see what you oh, think. Oh, yeah. That's, that's right in to the Meteor Podcast <laughs> at TheMeteor.com. <laughs> yeah, we'll take any explanations. We'll just take them as fact. Idaho mule deer. Well, you, killed yeah, you killed a giant mule deer. I was on fire. Well, I was on fire with tag draws. I didn't draw anything this year. I didn't draw any cool tags. This Used year. them last year, yep. But I was on fire with tag draws last year. I drew a, 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 I drew a deer tag down in Idaho and got just a stomper. If you want to see, um, it was just one of those deals. It's almost like misleading. And this happens on that. Like we have a lot of episodes where nothing happens. You get skunked, whatever. It Not happens. many. Yeah, but it happens. It happens, yeah. And then a lot of episodes where it's kind of normal hunting or you got to grind it out. Just one of those. Just one of those, like, just, uh, I don't know. It was just good. Stars aligned. Yeah, it was just like everything, like, just, just box. You could go do that. And I've seen this happen because 
we've had some great hunts then your buddies go back and they do it again and again and again and it's never like that again or i've got spots we hit every year and you're always chasing 10 years ago it was just something with just a ton of bucks man and then really good intel really good intel on both those well no on on one it was like i had some friends that had hit this area hard for archery and i had great they were like we saw a lot of action here like don't bother looking there so you kind of reduce this huge area down into a little area because they're like yeah don't waste your time don't waste your time now up there i would definitely spend some time and if not there i'll go spend some time over there but right so you go into it like really armed and man we had a good time and the i had more fun than anybody <laughs> the the mule deer uh, was, was a uh, one. yeah like 180 plus 190 yeah. plus 190 bigger than that Dang. was it a 200 inch mule deer smaller than that 198 smaller it's 96 95 four smaller three smaller yep <laughs> really 193 <laughs> two i don't know 190, dry 192 out. and some changes man yeah. Yeah. i dried it off i dried it in a bucket of water so it should still be the same <laughs> yeah put, <laughs> aged, put a <laughs> stick in there <laughs> i aged it in the bucket of water so i don't think anything changed um that's in there your biggest mule deer uh-uh no no, for real. Yeah, was the Idaho he's, one? I'm like a. I'm like a <laughs> he's in the two on deck club. Yeah, I'm in, did you kill a two hundred inch? Yeah, I did. Was that, that Idaho one I'll be done. years ago? Mm-hmm. Two hundred. Mm-hmm. He's in that book. The uh, was it Big Bucks of Idaho or something? Great box of great, great mule deer box of Idaho. Yeah, really. That buck will probably be in the calendar. I imagine. No, it's not. Really, there's not a lot of big old. There's not a lot of grip and grins the, in there. The the uh, the Idaho buck is on the cover. Of this, this of last season. Season 12. Or, nice. Yeah. Oh, that new, yeah. yeah. But the old, the over 200 one yeah. is not in there. You know, it's the funny thing about, um, like, I've hunted mule deer in, you know, I've hunted mule deer in Montana for over 20 years. Yeah, over 20 years. Mm-hmm. Well, Seth's mama was still wiping Seth's his mama nose. was still wiping my nose. <laughs> <laughs> And <laughs> when I started hunting, okay, and have covered a lot of ground and just hunted a lot of, like, a ton of public land, mule deer. Yeah. Um, in Montana, 20 years worth. But when you go look at my, like, my wall where I have my like big stuff collection. <laughs> Just listen to this. Not one of those boxes from Montana. Really? It's like you look at like, I've just looked, look, look, look like a decade, whatever. And then you go to some of these other States to the South, you know, gangbusters, other directions. Yeah. And you're like, Oh, there, there's like more big bucks than I ever saw in 10 yeah. years of hunting. <laughs> yeah. It's just the toll, the toll of having like, of having, these long six week rifle seasons that mm-hmm. run through the rut. Yep. That it's just you just aren't making, you know, they're not the the, the state is not prioritizing. I'm not critic I'm not criticizing for this. Mm-hmm. They're not prioritizing they're, they're pri- prioritizing opportunity, opportunity over quality over quality. Bucks. But it's just amazing that you can go, you know, Utah, Colorado, Idaho, New Mexico. And it's like, oh, there's the muley. I've always wondered where they all are. Yeah. They're, they're here. Yeah. Like, what happens when you don't just gun for them so hard? But with that being said, there are some running around in Montana. Oh, for sure. But which, I mean, it's not like you can take an empirical approach to it and just go look at Boone and Crockett entries. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, they're, they're there. They are there. But like on public ground, um, I haven't killed a. I've never killed, I don't think I've ever killed a muley buck on private ground. I've never killed a bull elk on private ground. Um, I have a buddy that killed a 200 inch mule deer buck in Montana on block management. Yep. I would count that as public. But mm-hmm. it's just one of those things where right time, it was the rut. And yep. He probably moved off a piece of he made private. a little, He made a mistake. Yep. Yep. Suicide. So it can happen. So speaking of the live shows, Remember earlier I was plugging our live, oh, our live yeah. shows coming up? 
uh, years ago, me and Yanni were at a live show. I know some. I keep seeing action out that window. Yeah. I'm looking for horns. We were at a live show years ago, and it was funny because we were at a live show, I believe, in Idaho. We did a live show, and or somewhere, I can't remember where. And a dude named uh, Richard Martinez came up, and he said to me and Yanni, "You should come hunt turkeys in the Everglades." Mm. with me and he gave me a book he brought me a gift and gave me a book about the everglades and i started at that time me and yanni started applying for state game areas and it took years for us to draw the state game area tag i think we were pretty consistent about our application oh i bet you guys were so eventually we drew because we wanted to both have it so we're like party app right and we party apped and eventually drew our Everglades turkey tags and got to hook up with this dude, Richard Martinez. Passionate about it. Who's a very good turkey hunter. Yeah. Really serious outdoorsman. Um, and what's funny about this, hanging out with this guy, we got a whole episode. This is a, one of the, just to return back, this is one of the season 12 episodes where we go hunt Osceola turkeys um, with our buddy down there in, in Florida and how cool it was. But uh, it just so happened through some other work stuff. I spent a bunch of time in Florida. And this is not the knock, but like there's a lot of people, like it, it's pretty common. This is going to really piss a bunch of people off. Um, and people that aren't pissed are going to wonder why this would piss people off, but there will be some pissed people. Th- there are states where you, where you hear a lot of unhappiness from hunters and anglers. You know, there's just like states that generate a lot of resentment on how it's managed or yeah management success rates whatever there are just there there are states where um there are states where you just get where a lot of unhappy folk and holy smokes is florida one of them fix your mic i couldn't believe it yeah, which is kind of surprising. Yeah, like some states you go there and, you know, like here, here's the thing too, and this is the point I make oftentimes. Everywhere you go in the country, and I've been, and I've been able to, you know, I've, been, I've had the great fortune over my career as a writer and doing TV and other, other enterprises I've been involved in where I've been able to just to go everywhere, right? I've been, I've been able to, um, I haven't hunted, I mean, I've been to all the states. I've hunted and fished in most of them. And I just get to meet and talk to a lot of people. And the thing that I've always marveled at and puzzled over was that everywhere you go, there, you'll, you'll hear two stories, versions of two narratives. And these narratives could come from people who are next door neighbors. <laughs> there's, there's this, there's narrative A. Narrative A is, uh, um, all the good spots are gone. Everything got, you know, outsiders came in. The out-of-staters ruined it. The wolves ruined it. The coyotes ruined it. Fish and game ruined it. Um, Hopeless. It's like, I don't even go anymore. I lost my spot. Uh, you name it. Okay, and then next door, everywhere you go, next door, not always next door, but I mean like in the same, in the same universe, the same is, is you can't even scratch the surface. Yeah. I can't Mm. wait to get out of bed in the morning. That was rich. You can't do it all. The question is, which one are you, Seth? So he's a can't scratch the surface. Yeah. So this has always just been like a a thing of mine. And it's funny because here's this dude that we hang out with who like is just a can't scratch the surface guy, man. Mm -hmm. But dude, he scouts hard. Yeah. He like, if he's not hunting, he's looking for hunting spots. He might like scouting more than the hunt. He works his ass off, but he's just like in a place that's in a place and he, he hunts a lot of areas in a place where it's like, just, it just generates a lot of, you know, they got, they, they got so many cougars now and deer populations are down, but here's a guy just consistently, consistently 
deer on public land, turkeys on public land, working his butt off, can't scratch the surface, can't get to it all kind of guy. Yep. I liked hanging out with that dude. Mm, a little hard worker. Behind the scenes of that Florida trip, off topic, ping pong, I smoked you. Oh, we had a ping pong table. That's right. <laughs> so I had everybody beat me. Everyone, you came in. Everyone in that house beat you. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of a weird deal, man. Like, and you were shook up about it. Well, here's why I was coming in hot because it was like <laughs> uh, we had just your... got our kids. <laughs> yeah. This little net that you stretch out across your kitchen table. Yep. So for nights, dude. <laughs> Every night we ate dinner, we cleared the table, we stretched that net out and just played ping pong. He came man. in there thinking he was Joe Ping Pong. <laughs> so I was like pretty hot. ass whooped. <laughs> I was pretty hot. And I also felt because I was playing on a slightly smaller kitchen table. Uh, dining room table, be narrow. <laughs> and our be dining room table is one of those ones that looks like it was cut from one huge tree, so it's got curvy edges. Mm. And so if I was kicking my kids' butts on that thing... I thought I was going to come in and whoop you guys <laughs> Didn't happen. at ping pong. Because I'm like beating my eight-year-old, <laughs> beating my 10-year-old, sometimes beating my 13-year-old. So I came in there like just ready to mop you guys up, man. <laughs> yeah. And just everybody beat my ass, dude. And I was coming in fresh <laughs> off the home table. <laughs> but a thing I hadn't figured, man, is like, this is an outdoor ping pong table. Oh, there was some wind. And those are susceptible to wind drift. Yep, and sun hmm. direction. There was, yeah. But everybody was subject to the same wind drift. <laughs> yep. But man, just everybody. Yanni, dude. <laughs> just beat my butt. Time I bet Yanni time was good. Yeah. He, oh, yeah, he's good. He's <laughs> got like, he just seems, he looks like a dude to be good at ping pong. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Dirt, yeah, man. got my ass kicked at ping pong <laughs> bad every night. So when you're watching that episode just, and you've seen me having a good time turkey hunting, I want you to picture me just getting my <laughs> ass kicked at ping pong at night. And taking it out on them <laughs> Osceola's, baby. Mm. You were the first tag out. Oh, that was a good trip, man. What a cool space. That, that, was, was, that was second to tag out. Dirt, I was going to ask you, when did you start filming for Meat Eater? Uh, 2015, I think. So what season was that? Like season four or five? I, I thought... You were in early, dude. Yeah, it was early. Yeah, probably. Four. Season four. Four. Maybe. So you filmed four through 12? I'd have to look, but yeah, fourth or fifth season. Sometimes you'll get off on other stupid projects and might work <laughs> with us. Uh, it's not won't. It can't. It's... Yeah, you get. Mm. He's an international player. Gotta pay the bills. Gotta pay the bills. How many bills. continents have you filmed on dirt? Count North America. North America, South America. It's like 22 Africa. or 23. Countries. Oh, 20. continents. Yeah, countries. Is, yeah, a little over 20. You filmed in 20 countries. Yeah. That's incredible. My favorite is... Uh, America? Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, brother. <laughs> I've said this quote so many times, but we're in Alaska right now. It reminds me of it. One time a TV executive... Said, uh, I don't want to say where, but a TV executive said to me, the only other country our viewers are interested in is Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair, kind of. You look at uh, Europe. Um, so there's that episode. Then there's a really, oh, you were on this one too, Dirt? Mm -hmm. I think I only missed those two bangers. Spearfi yeah, spearfish in the Bahamas. Oh, oh yeah. What a Dude, heck of a trip. Like, you can swim too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dirt, dirt's like a little otter. Well, oh, shark I bait. say that. <laughs> Dirt's shark the perfect slick. cameraman. He's slick in the water. Oh, yeah. Dirt's, if you, got, if you need a backcountry cameraman. Back, well, backcountry hiking, hauling. He was hauling moose meat. Oh, you guys, come on. He was hauling, no doubt, 120 pound pack. Yeah, ridiculous amount of Stomping me, carrying probably an 85 pound pack. Yeah, you've been butchering, though. You guys have been He's butchering. He's a sturdy little feller. He is. <laughs> sturdy little feller. That Bahamas was a sweet. That blew my mind. Uh, when Guy was cutting that episode, mm -hmm. he was trying to keep count. Um, I think he came in that we had 16 and a half species. Wow. Oh, nice. That was what... Because really one of those fish came in just half of it. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the sharks. Because <laughs> sharks. The sharks were gnarly on that one. Yeah. Huh? But, uh, man, some lot like nice groupers, speared a lot of nice groupers, had just... Look at the window, Steve. Oh. Oh, nice moose. We're, we're looking out the window at a guy putting a big moose rack in the back of a truck. Good for him. Wow. Nice. Seen bigger. You probably <laughs> got 
<laughs> 16 and a half. Yeah. Does that count in the deep drop stuff? Oh, yeah. So wow. we had, um, yeah. So we were with Kimmy, uh, Kimmy Werner and then Cameron Kirk Connell. Cameron Kirk Connell, um, we, for, for those of you who've listened to our show, our Campfire Stories series, so one of, the, one of the things we make is we make this thing called Campfire Stories. So we did Meat Eater Campfire Stories. It's an audio book. It's an audio original. It's not an audio book. It's an audio original. It's like very edited storytelling from, from disparate voices. And um, if you haven't heard it, you should definitely check it out. Um, and we had volume one, Close Calls. And then volume two is Narrow Misses and More Close Calls. We have volume three coming up, which is Discoveries. So people find crazy stuff bodies money whatever just like crazy discoveries beans bodies means yeah i'm gonna do a whole episode on me finding more pole beans after my kids have picked them all <laughs> after they've picked them all i'll go out and pick 50 more um and uh but in in close calls cameron kirk connell we even ran it people especially you know this because when we were promoting meters campfire stories close calls we promoted it with our Cameron Kirk Connell story. So Cameron Kirk Connell um, grew up in Florida, but spends a ton of time in the Bahamas. And he tells a story about when he was a tarpon guide. It's if you listen back in episodes, you'll find it. He was a tarpon guy, but went spear fishing one day, and they were chasing after a Kubera snapper. And Cameron Kirk Connell's dive partner had a blackout. So Cameron Kirk Connell is down deep. His dive partner was supposed to be on the surface. They're taking turns watching each other. But the guy must have seen something from the surface and went after it. So Cameron Kirk Connell's down deep, and here comes the guy sinking in a sort of like upright crisscross applesauce, formerly known as Indian style. When you oh, cross really? your legs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they don't call it that anymore. Oh. When you go to school, my kids, they don't even know what that is. They think it's crisscross applesauce. <laughs> oh. I'm like, what shit. in the hell? What now? <laughs> How you said it? <laughs> So crisscross applesauce, Whoa. and he's sinking, passed out. And Cameron Kirk Connell's going to shoot him because he's out of air and he's on his way up. And so he's like, he's at least going to try to shoot him with the spear shaft. So he can drag him back to the surface and, and save his life. And he's going to shoot him in the calf. Yeah. But the body's spinning. So he's already down on his way up, and he has to go crossways to get to him. And there's no way he's going to drag him up. They're both going to die. He spins, and then his only shot is to shoot him in the in the thigh. But he's afraid if he shoots him in the thigh, he's going to bleed to death. So he lowers down and shoots him in the fin with his spear gun. Long shot, too. And there's guys on the boat. So he gets up to the surface. And he's like, pull, pull, pull. And they drag this dude up and resuscitate him. Dialed, man. He tells it is just an <clears throat> insane story yeah. that he tells. Yeah. So that's how he and I became friends. He's he's a guide. He's guided all over the world fishing, um, and he's a, he's like a, he's he's a boat captain. He's whatever like boat clat. You know, like they do like oh merchant marine, right? Or, well, yeah, but they do. You know, you're a captain for whatever tonnages. He's a captain any class. Mm. Super dialed. So he could drive my Sea Arc 1660. <laughs> That's what wow. I'm trying to say. Wow. <laughs> what about yeah. the bigger sea arc? Or a cruise ship. could drive <laughs> or a cruise sea ship. arc, maybe. <laughs> my canoe, my sea arc 1660. Let him go, baby. He's got or, it. Or, uh, you know, the Princess Ocean Liners. Titanic. No, man. I, watching you guys dive that stuff was So amazing. you want to talk about a good diver. And then, yeah. like, Kimmy Warner's a phenomenal diver. So, so okay. basically, it's like a show where you watch me get my ass kicked by Oh, people. you were crushing. Yeah. Well, I was doing good, but I wasn't as good as those guys. Those guys are good, man. God, those guys are good in the water. And it, that that recovery has only been recent, right? After that, the hurricanes in uh, eighteen or something in Bahamas. Yep. That's cool. Then, then there's more. Lastly, Alaska with Doctor Randall and Clay Newcomb. Oh, black bears, epic! Hunt. And that is the epic I'm- wetsuit black bear hunt. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing it. I hadn't seen it. I didn't show it to you. I don't know why I didn't show it to you. Usually I'll show it to people. You've never showed me a single episode I've been on before it came out. 
which maybe I'll say sometimes I show it to people. <laughs> <laughs> I show it to anyone that asks. I'm trying not to be a pain. Mm-hmm. So Yanni, just, he always wants to see. He always got comments. I always really? pass along. I didn't Yanni know that was an option. <laughs> oh yeah, Yanni, will get right in there. Because mm. he'd be like, "Hey, but what about remember that time we did X?" I'd be like, oh, "I forgot about that." Man, I would then be I'll have great the editor at that. Dig around and find stuff that we had forgotten about. I've I've got middle notes like a elephant. Really? Oh well, that's good to keep in mind because Yanni will quite often be like, "But dude, why why didn't they use the stuff about the whatever? Uh, I don't know the owl or whatever. I don't know. I'm just making that up." Mm. And then we'll dig in there and find it. Hmm. Is there still time on the last episode? Uh, <laughs> it's done. <laughs> so when we're working on an episode, what we do is like we film, we come back, and first someone goes through and scours it for everything usable. We do producer notes, which lays it out. I'll often have some stuff I'll talk about, like, well, like this is the sort of the main thing we're after, and this is all what I'm interested in. Then it'll go to what's called a rough cut. And we'll get the rough cut, and it'll have like scratch VO. And then I'll start writing VO. Yeah. And we'll do like general, like, well, this is kind of boring, and that should be moved around. And yeah. It's not really understand. And what about the owl, right? That kind of stuff. And then it'll go to fine. And then usually at fine, I would show it to Yanni if he's in it or whoever. Then from fine, it goes to pick lock. And then from pick lock, it goes to sound and, and sound. And it's what? done. Color. Right. Color correction. I think, yeah. And then you don't want to dig back into it. Everybody gets riled up. Yeah, sure. Just got one point back about the Bahamas. Mm-hmm. All the beautiful underwater filming was not me. That was Justin Parent. and Parent. Parent, yeah. yeah. Kimmy Werner's husband, Justin Turkowski. Yep. Those and guys. And Parent. Parent James. James. Parent James. Those dudes are some little river otters, man. Dude, yeah. those when they'd get the guns, they were smoking fish. Oh, they fish could shoot too. too, dude. Legendary underwater yeah. cinnies. Phenomenal. Those guys. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Very good underwater cinematographers, wherever you call them. Underwater camera guys is what I like to call them. <laughs> <laughs> that works. Yeah. The so best. there you have it, man. Season 12. Gosh, that's going to be good. Mm-hmm. October 12th. Good job, Dirt. That's when it starts. Dirt, dirt's, dirt's pumping it up, man. It was fancy coffee over to it. from the Sanex. <laughs> so Clay, give us a quick give us a quick wrap up of what we've been doing, Clay. So we've been in we're we are currently in Alaska. We've been on our uh, moose hunt, our annual moose our hunt. Our annual moose hunt. And um this year we were on a different ridge than last year. Mm-hmm. And we I've never hunted the same ridge top twice. Twice, yeah. Bounce and so down. We, we came to a new ridge, and and, and this kind of hunting, you fly in, there's a small airstrip that you're able to land, Super Cubs. You camp close to the airstrip, and you, you can only kill a moose as close as you can get the moose. Toad them. Toad them back up to the airstrip. We planned this hunt for nine days and planned the hunt so that it ended in the latter part of the season because the f- closer you get deeper you get into to September, the better the moose rut's going to be, guaranteed, really anywhere. And so we, we started our hunt on September the 10th, I believe. Might have been the 11th, but yeah. 11th. 11th, right yeah. yeah. 11th. And, and what we saw last year, what we hear from people, what Steve's experienced, this is my second moose hunt, so clearly I'm an expert now, <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that just every day you see the rut pick up more and more. And it's a calling game, so... You, you don't have a lot of mobility. Like in elk hunting, you, you, you can, you're moving around, you're calling, you might see elk, two drainages over, and you figure out how to get over there. Yeah. This is not that. You, you pretty much have a stationary place that you're calling from, and you're, you're calling kind of long-term calling. The way I think about it is there's a lot of calling that you get an immediate response, mm-hmm. and you know if your calling was successful Yep. Within seconds yeah, or when minutes. You call, when you're calling and some ducks, you call know in about ducks. four seconds. <laughs> call an elk. <laughs> yeah, or if you like turks. Just call a turkey and he gobbles back. Yeah, here, yeah, yeah. Know. So this is more like you're just feeding, seeding calls into the into the into this very vast landscape. And if I want to point out, if you don't call them, you ain't going to get them. 
Mm-hmm. That's right. I mean, it could happen, but it's like it would not be a reliable strategy that you're just going to wait and one's going to walk by. Yeah. And so no. you're, 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 we're hunting this like rolling, rolling hills, big, bigger mountains. And so what you can see is probably only 40% of what is actually there. I mean, you know, rolling off into these big yeah, draws. You so, see one side of the hill, but not the other. Right. Or, yeah. or your, your call is going down into this draw. Mm-hmm. that you can't see what's going on down there. And so we got into this spot the first day. Is this about the pace you want this story oh, to go? Great job. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we get in here the first day, and the clouds parted. We had a little bit of cloud cover, I'm pretty sure the first day. Got in there late in the morning, and within 30 minutes, we saw a bull within about two miles of where we're sitting. This the, the landscape is willow flats, spruce draws and patches, and just tundra. And so some of it you can't see real well, but some of it you can. Where we were sitting, we could see a big saddle between two ridges, and we could. But we could also see miles and miles away on these like high alpine tundra e mountains that. If we saw a moose there, it really meant nothing to us other than just it was fun to see him. Yeah. I mean, we were spotting moose five miles away. Oh, yeah. yeah. So the first, the first morning, within 30 minutes, we saw a moose two miles away, which is semi in play because potentially that moose could hear us and we could call him. And maybe two days later, he'd show up in our yeah. draw. We called one. Um, we called one from two miles one day. And he came in in about a, over about the course of about an hour. In yeah. The past. Yeah. And and it, it, some it could even been. We debate it, it was a minimum of two miles. A minimum That's impressive. Of two miles away. Yeah. They can hear, and you can always tell when they can hear you because you you have a we have a we've got a new call that we're prototyping from Phelps, and you you moose call, and you can see the moose. They always they they'll turn and look at you and just stare if they hear you. <laughs> You know, and you it's can, like two satellite dishes just being like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, they'll, and they'll sit, they'll lock up, just and spend minutes without moving, staring right in the right direction with them big old satellite ears out, yeah, with their horns. So you can tell, like, if one's way out there, you call and you watch him, and you're like, he can hear us, and then you you measure your calling from yeah, that. How much he cares is who knows, but you'll right. know, you'll know like absolutely he hears you. A lot of times you'll call and you'll see him like start raking a bush. Like they, they'll kind of be like, that excites me. Yeah. Not going to come over there, but I'm going to rake this bush. Yeah. <laughs> like you come <laughs> here. And uh, we're doing three types of calling, cow calls, bull grunts, and raking. So actually taking, Steve was using the scapula of a bull moose from another year and scraping on the trees. And these are basically the three communication mechanisms. Day one, we see a bull way off. Later that afternoon, we spot, Seth spots two bulls, we believe Mild, five, mile, yeah. five miles mm-hmm. away. First day, three bulls. Second day, we roll in, we're sitting in the same spot. We have this, we have a, and, and our, our, where we're hunting is a, again, a saddle between two ridges, and we can probably see out eight or 900 yards in this saddle two big draws coming up from either side and second day i believe it was like 10 or 11 in the morning we see a good bull come into our saddle we had no knowledge that he was really around he just appeared in our saddle had been calling all morning we've been calling all morning so presu- possibly he was coming to our calls he he appears we start calling to him more aggressively to try to get him in close he'll he came into like 675 yards Locked up in a spruce patch, Grunt, bedded down. Grunting. Well, no, you left out some pre- prime detail. I'm just okay. Grunting. Yeah. Thrash and brush. Yeah. Ooh. We thought it was on. Give us a moose grunt. Oh. Oh. Yeah. You know, oh. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like you're walking through the woods and, and you keep your get your, a little your little nut tap from the brush on. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh. 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 Yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah that's that's good <laughs> so <laughs> this was day two and this is we believe a mid 50s bull so in, in the in the world of big moose hunting like american moose are going to be smaller you're going to hear guys in montana idaho 
you know, a 50 inch plus moose in those places is going to be pretty big. Yeah, Shirus the moose. Shirus moose. And then the Canadian, Canadian moose, moose is going to yeah. be smaller. In the U- in the Alaskan, big Alaska, Yukon moose, which would also be in, in uh, the Yukon, British Columbia. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's, no, I don't think it's. British Columbia. Maybe Northern have, British, Southern British Columbia is. C- Canada moose. Yeah. I, I want to say the upper part of BC is probably is it, Yukon, but I don't know. Yukon? I don't okay. know. I but have, I but, a, that but a but a a good shooter moose is going to be in the fifty inch range, fifty inch plus. Top end would be like seventy inches. Yep. And very few people. Oftentimes the regulations go that. Um. So like in the state of Alaska, they'll tweak moose regulations. They'll, different units will have different open dates. Different units will have different close dates, and you'll quite often see. Um, it's pretty typical that. A moose has to be 50 inch tip to tip, so 50 inch spread, and or they'll specify how many brow tines it needs on one side. Mm-hmm. So you might be in an area that has a it's a three what they would call a three brow tine unit, meaning if one of his sides has three brow tines, it's legal. You could be in a four brow tine unit, where if one of his sides has four brow tines, he's legal. But he could have zero brow tines and be 50. Or he could have no paddles, but have four brow tines. So it's either or. Right. Um, and this bull would have, was plenty legal in both ways. Yeah, he had a lot of brow tines, was well over 50 inches wide. And we felt like we were going to kill him on day two. He bedded yep. down. We, we messed with him for several hours. He was within 700 yards for several hours. He bedded down three different times. But the more we called to him, the more he hung around, the less he was interested. And he fades off into the willow brush going away from us two o'clock that afternoon. That was the last action we had on day two. We go into day three. We see nothing but a cow moose. We sit on that hill for 12 hours. So the sequence of our hunt is, is that these are long days up here right now, 12 hour days. And we wake up when the sun starts you know, when the sky starts to get light, have some coffee, have a little breakfast, head out when you can see good, get on the side of the mountain and you, literally be there sit hours. there for 12 hours. And if you really, you could sit till 730, but you could still probably shoot till 830. But yeah. at a point, you just got to be like, at a point, you've been there 12 hours. Yeah. That's a long sit. And so it's a long sit when you're not seeing anything. So that that third day, we didn't even see the far off bull. So sometimes you're just entertained by watching through the glass these bulls way off and thinking is that the day we saw, was it day three we saw the black bear uh-huh. go ripping through yeah i think so yeah that was like the only thing we saw that day i think yeah we did see one black bear we had a black bear tag but couldn't it just we just saw a flash of a black bear yeah day four so that was a tough day we all yep. said that that was a tough day and the other thing about this hunt is that it the, the temperatures seem like they're reasonable you know let's say mid 20s to mid 40s to mid 40s and it's like that's not that cold but man when you're out there for 10 days constantly battling that and and wind and high humidity we were freezing to death we were you're just sitting it's so damn windy and you're just sitting yep so it's it's a real struggle to just stay warm even with good gear and like all the gear you need we were Making little fire. You can do and, it like you can really get layered up and be good, but it's just you're just not doing anything to generate any warmth. Yeah. For for like I said, ten, twelve hours yep. set. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, but we talked about how much this this type of hunting is so different than many other hunts. It's uh it's a unique hunt and you gotta be in the right state of mind to mm-hmm. sit in the same place for potentially nine or ten days for twelve hours a day. And not be validated by n- not seeing game. Yeah, and a lot of whitetail hunters will say, "Oh, that's easy. I do that all the time in yep. November." It's just different. Yep. I mean, it's I've different. done lots of all day sits for whitetails. It's yeah. different. Yeah. So day uh, day four, we didn't see anything either, did we? Mm-mm. Our our neighborhood no, mouse. I saw I saw a glimpse oh, of yeah. a cow. The same, probably the same cow. And so, those long bulls, I think you saw. Yeah, I picked up those day long. four, we saw the bulls that were five miles away, or one bull five miles away, and a cow close. So that's two yeah. tough days. And and it's it's taxing mentally. And uh, 
were you know it is fun when you're with a group of guys though you're all talking the whole day and you're eating snacks whispering and and we we were all all of us were calling and so we we named <laughs> the, everybody has a little different tone and frequency and vibe with their moose call we decided that dirt probably had the best cow moose call seth was clearly the best bull grunter i'll take it and um and so on day five comes around and and it's just a game of odds i like a hunt that's just a game of odds i can sit somewhere for a long time i'll mm. sit there and i like it when that's what you're working against yep like it doesn't take a whole lot of skill to just sit there tenacity for just for days yeah what'd you guys say it's like there's physical suffrage and there's there's two there's two ways to suffer hunting yep there's more but like like just general stuff that's physically taxing yep um, you know, it's like getting up and pounding it out and pounding it out and hiking back up the top of the mountain, hiking back up the top of the mountain, hiking through the swamp, whatever the hell it is. And then there's just like the mental, like Patience. just sitting, yeah, sitting. And you're looking at such incredible being like country. it's yeah. be, being like like a friend of mine who does it. He's like it's trusting the process mm-hmm. that there are these things. They're called moose, <clears throat> and they are going to get into the rut and they're going to start moving. And they're going to be receptive to calling, and you need to be there calling, and they're going to hear it, and they're going to come. And yeah. it might not happen until the last day. <laughs> it yeah, might yeah. Not happen for ten days. <laughs> one, yeah. one of the one of the yeah. boys that seen us when we landed today mm-hmm. saw that other that other moose head, mm-hmm. and he's, oh, that's what they look like. <laughs> They'd been out probably ten days, not even seen a moose. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so day five comes. We go to our spot. We it, it's like you. You feel like it's going to happen, but you never feel like it's going to happen today. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're like, I know, I just feel like we're going to kill a moose. We're, we're doing the right stuff, but it probably won't happen today. That's the way I always feel. It's hard, to picture, tomorrow. It's hard to picture it happening. Yeah. Yeah. But we did see a cow in that same zone that we had seen that bull on day two, mm-hmm. which was... Yeah. yeah, we had was a cow in our in our in our saddle that was mm-hmm. kind of in our zone. You know, within 800 yards of us, saw a cow, and and again, the moose rut's picking up, and we we know that's happening not because of what we're seeing, but just because we know it's happening. And about 10 o'clock, day five, Seth looks in a direction that we weren't focusing a lot of attention. Well, he moved. Mm. He had been glassing for four days from one spot. He moved like six feet. He moved down slope to a spot he'd never before sat in. Wow. Yep. Had a feeling. He moved down slope ever so slightly. And the minute he got there, that's the noise of him seeing a moose. There's a bull. (laughs) He said, he said, I got a bull in the spruce. And this bull was, would we say it was a mile away? At least. I think it was a mile. I might be able to tell you how far it was away. It, it was it was on, it was close that. to a mile. Maybe I would have said three quarters of a mile exactly away. How far away it was? Okay, and well, this is like ten o'clock, right? Ten o'clock in the morning, and and what we learned is on this landscape, there's let's just say there's three things going on: tundra, willows, and spruce. That's all there is in this part of Alaska. And we, man, the the bulls just stick. It's like a willow aspen birch mix. Yeah, yeah, you're right. But Willows, like, Aspen, Birch. Yeah, it, all looks uh, fairly deciduous, similar. Yeah. Deciduous hardwood it's, type. It's brushy. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there, there's small. The, the the least of those is the spruce where we're at. Like yes. There's little draws of spruce. And anyway, Seth sees a bull. Sees satellite paddles. And what you're looking for when you're glassing for these moose is not. You're not looking for moose. You're looking for paddles. Yeah, yeah. They're white. Big white. Big white paddles Just sticking but, out, but it takes you a while to understand the scale of what one looks like. The first one you see every year, you're like, "Oh, oh, that's what they look like from a mile and a half," and they're always smaller than you think. Yep. But when I see the one, when I saw the ones you found, Seth, five miles away, they were bigger than I thought they yeah. would be. I thought the same. But when the bull was in our saddle, six hundred yards away, he was way smaller than I thought he would be. It's like this game of scale, yeah. like trying to. Figure out what they look like. So he sees one. We rip a cow call. Ah! And bam, nice. he 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 
slams our direction. We know he hears us. He locks in on us. Now all four of us are looking, trying to find the bull, and we're like, oh, we see him. There he is. He's looking at us. And then directly we see him moving our way. And that's always a good sign when you get a quick response. He, he just kind of moving our direction, but we're not too fired up. He, he comes around the point of this, kind of on the spine of this little ridge. I can't tell. A mile away. Mile? Sorry. Mile? Yeah, never mind. I can't tell. Okay. <laughs> but in and out with the vegetation. Oh, yeah. You can't him see constantly. him the whole. You can't yeah. see him. So, so, but he, but he's coming our, he, we see him like 50 yards from where he was and he's coming our way and then we get excited, hit him again with a call. And you're always trying to understand how much calling do we need? Because we felt like we might've overcalled the bull that was real close to us the other day. And so you're like, what, what does this bull want to hear? Yeah, you're like feeling him out. And know? so we noticed that every time that I called, he would start moving before the, he got to the point where he would stop. I would call, he would start moving towards me before I even finished the call. Yep. And that tells you he likes it. And so we, we called a lot and just kind of trying to guide him in. And then he got into the thick aspen willow brush yep. and we could just see bits and pieces of him. And the sequence from him coming to the spruce to coming within 300 yards was probably, I would say, a 40-minute ordeal, mm -hmm. 30, 30 plus. And we, we're seeing bits and pieces of him. And at first... Steve Ranella, you I remember you said you didn't get the vibe that he was a real big bull. I said it's not he's not a 70 incher. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I, I I we can review the footage. I just remember this isn't this isn't bad. I'm just saying yeah. this is what you're going through. I'm trying to no, describe no. Like yeah. you, you, when you first see it. Well, let me tell you why. Okay. I was doing a okay. Here's where I screwed up. Early on. I was doing a comparison of looking at the fronts and the paddles. Mm, that'll get that'll get you on this and one. And when you see this particular animal, you will understand why. Because you're like, what? Well, what? Why is his? Why, why is he widest at his fronts? Yeah, which led me to have it just it just threw it was throwing me off. Then so, later, I was starting to get a, a much. Once we, I saw the extent of it, I was starting to get a much different vibe. Yeah. But early on, I was just, I wasn't like, it didn't look like sheets, of, it didn't look like half sheets of plywood coming through the woods. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to wrap this up in five minutes. You know, yeah, we're running out of, that's good. We're running out of that's space good. on the so, card. Don't, yeah, don't, don't spoil the end. So the bull's coming in. We're, we're trying to, we know it's a shooter. It just looks like, oh, that. from the, from but, the get go. I, man, I've learned with moose when I see paddles, no matter what distance, I'm like, it's a monster. I'm just, <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, you're rooting for him. It's yeah, inspiring. Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. Like, but I, when the first second I saw this moose, all that I, my, registered on my mind was I was like, golly, that's a lot of paddle. Yeah. It just looked. It was just a, the volume of paddle was big, and man, the closer he got, the bigger he got. And pretty soon we're getting, we're all getting really good looks at him. And, and he's just big, huge fronts. And, and you're, you're looking for brow tines on these bulls. And, you know, you're, you're happy if you see one with four brow tines on each side. Palm this bull's out. got 10 brow tines on both sides. Just poof, supernova. I think that should be its <laughs> yeah. name. A little champagne supernova. Yeah. <laughs> and he's loving and, your call. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and we're, we're constantly trying to decide how much to call. Every time we call, he's moving, so we keep giving him what he wants, and he's not coming directly to us. He's swinging around trying to get downwind, which is what they typically do. Mm. And, and but he, I mean, we got him because he's got to cross through a yeah, big he's like, open man, area. Man, I like everything I'm hearing. I like everything I'm hearing, but I just like to get a little sniff before I just barge. I don't want to go barge in there without a little sniff. Yep. yep. Like I want to get a lay of the land. Like who's up there? What's going on? Is it a bull? Is it? What, yeah, just yeah, a little yeah. sniff, little yeah. sniff. Yeah. What's a good sniff test? Is it Tammy? I mean, I mean, no. Is it? <laughs> yeah. Who is it? Is that Jay? <laughs> yeah. So, but he we got to wrap this up pretty he, yeah, quick. But he though. doesn't desperately want to get downwind, but he wants to get downwind. Yeah, and we feel like every time we call, it, it, it he's just pulling a little bit tighter to us. I don't know if that was true. Oh yeah, I think so. But we were calling a lot, and you'll see this on the one day this will come out, and you'll get to watch it. And man. 
I mean, it 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 was that forty minute sequence was as good of of a hunt as there is on planet Earth. I mean, it, for real, just watching him come, the excitement of trying to gauge how big he is. Is he going to come? Is he not? We've been here. We we worked so hard to get here. This is a crazy place. We're yep. cold. We're tired. We're and here he comes, and then he's big. And I mean, it was just it was it was exciting. One of the last things we witnessed him do, um, is he went to thrash in a tree, and for some reason stuck his horn down in the ground like a spade shovel, and <laughs> kicked that dust, a, threw up Uprooted. a clod, of, threw up a clod of soil. Yeah. And kept walking. Oh. Yeah. Like, that ain't nothing. Well, is and he then, still out there? Is he still out there? Or is he in the van? <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to stay tuned. <laughs> is that the way we're going to leave it? Well, yeah, we're going to leave it like this. Oh, my gosh. <sighs> Was that a miss or a hit, though? You don't know. Yeah. And one more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> nice. <laughs>